Morning's um, Committee for Community me Communities meeting. In the room with me today, I have Andy Allen on Starleaf. We have Mark Durkin, Alex Eason, Sinead Innes, the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, Karen Mullen and Fran McCann. So you're all very welcome. I'll move on then to agenda item one, which is apologies. I've received an apology from Robin Newton. Any other uh, apologies anybody wants to give at this stage? Anybody needing to leave early or anything? No, we're okay? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Okay, Alex, I know you said to me, I forgot about that, that you need to leave um, earlier. Um, that's fine. Okay, I'm going to move on to agenda item two, which is the draft minutes. You'll find the draft minutes of the 27th of May 21 at page six of your meeting pack. Can I ask, are you content to agree um, those minutes has drafted? Can I get an agreement? Agreed. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to move on then to agenda item three, which is chairperson's business. Just to remind members that on Tuesday, the committee held a very informative, informal stakeholder event with St Vincent de Paul and Development Trust NI. Um, Kelly chaired the event and a note of the meeting will be circulated in due course to members and considered at a formal meeting in the next couple of weeks so that we can decide on any actions we wish to take. Um, I want to ask if members any comments or content to know. Kelly, do you want to say anything on that? And My apologies, I wasn't able to make it on Tuesday. Um, Chair, it, it, we had the two organisations, Development Trusts Northern Ireland and St Vincent de Paul. Um, we passed on our thanks to the community voluntary sector um, for all the work that they did during COVID. As we know, this that was a meeting to discuss. Coming out of COVID, there was an interesting discussion with the Development Trusts Northern Ireland about um, their proposals for 11 community hubs across Northern Ireland. Um, I know that there are already family hubs um, that Action on Children, for instance, and other organisations would be involved in, um, but it might be something that we perhaps want to tease out um, at some stage whenever um, you know we're able to meet in person and maybe have an event um, with some of those organisations um, to bring further forward some of their discussions and collaborative working. Thank you, Kelly. And um, yeah, once we get the report then through the committee, then we can look at those actions um, that we want to do. Are members then content that I move on? Yeah. Oh, Chair. Go ahead, Alex. Just, just to say, Kelly did a really good job chairing that meeting. So, just want to say thank you to her. So, thank you. That's it. Okay. That's just because I let you all speak first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, thank you, and I, I appreciate Kelly jumping in at the very last minute to do that, and, and thank you for that. Um, okay, members, um, I'm then going to move on then to your table papers. You've been provided with a paper from the examiner's statutory rules on the delegated powers with the proposed amendments to the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Also in your table papers is a paper from the department on the proposed series of additional amendments to the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill um, that were made after the committee stage was completed. Um, Angela Kelly, the examiner of statutory rules and Claire McCanny from the bill office are with us this morning. Um, so we will now go into closed session to deal with those, with those matters. Are members in agreement? Yeah. Okay, I'm now moving, in, moving into closed session. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members, uh, we'll go back then to agenda item four, which is matters arising. Can I inform members you've been provided a page 17 with a departmental response in relation to post office card accounts? Members, rather than get into discussion on this issue again today, you will recall at the meeting last week we had agreed to ask for a departmental briefing. This will now take place on the 24th of June. Um, we will cl collate all responses to date on this issue and put them in the pack for the meeting on that day. So are members content with that approach? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, then members can I ask you to turn to page 20 where you'll see a reply from the Department for Health in relation to full cost recovery for the voluntary community and social enterprise sector. The committee had previously received correspondence from NICFA highlighting concerns regarding full cost recovery and we had requested the department comment on this. The Department of Health response states that it is supportive of the need to pay fair rates to the, the voluntary community sector for the services such organisations provide and has provided details at appendix Appendix 1 of the types of arrangements it has in place. The Department of Health also states 
that without being privy to the exact arrangements to which NICFA are referring to, they are not able to provide a fully informed view on whether or not full cost recovery is being achieved or appropriate. Members, any comments or content to note? Um, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Kelly. Sorry, um, thank you, Chair. Um, I get the, the point of health coming back to say whether, and to be honest, at, at Flabbergast May We Minute, there has already been a cross-departmental agreement within the executive that 15% um, administration charges can be included and would be legitimate to cover um, known liabilities for charities. Um, the fact that health doesn't know that it's, if it's paying this or not is, is quite staggering. Um, I know we don't have an awful lot of time left within this um, mandate, um, but Maura Doherty was working on this within the department. Would it be worthwhile getting a written report from her of what the Concordat group, the Concordat agreement with the community and voluntary sector and um, the executive offices, um, how they're coming forward with considerations on full cost recovery and fair um, contracting. Um, at the development trusts meeting um, the other day, they had raised concerns that um, contracts are not being offered locally um, and that, that wealth um, wealth generation within local communities cannot happen because departments and, and other statutory bodies are not buying service, service, services um, from community and voluntary sectors. There are some community and voluntary sector organisations that cannot afford to subsidise contracts because they're not being paid a fair level compared to private companies. So I think it would be worthwhile asking um, the Department for Communities for an update on their position with regards to the Concordat Agreement and the 15% administration um, allowances that are and have been allowed in grants and contracts um, within the, the department and how that is impact or how that's being followed through across all of the um, government departments, given that they have the responsibility for the community and voluntary sector. Okay, no, thank you, Kelly, for that. Um, any other members want to make comment on that? I'm happy with Kelly's proposals. Are, are members in agreement with those? Yeah? And get a yes? A nod of the head, even? Yeah? Good, okay. Um, then that's fine. We'll take forward those proposals, Kelly, that you'd um, set out there. <laughs> and ask for that written briefing. Um, okay, members, I have nothing further then under matters arising. I'm going to move then on to agenda item five, which is a departmental briefing on the video replay service. Um, this is a briefing we very much have been looking forward to. Um, so can I welcome to the meeting, Tommy McCauley. Um, Tommy, you're very welcome. Um, do you want to move the members out then at this stage, Oliver, just for the briefing? And then, members, can I ask you if you can use your raise your hand function um, if you want to come in and ask some questions of Tommy? Um, okay, I'll hand over to you. Um, go ahead if you want to brief the committee. Good, good morning, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, if I could just start, start. Sorry, I'm having a bit of uh, difficulty with the feedback on the sound here, okay. so I'm hearing myself twice, which is never good. <laughs> Um, if I could start off by giving you a bit of background and context to Video re Relay Service and its role in our view of the bigger picture of interpreting. So I'm fine. Sorry, I'll maybe try well without the head. Sure. Give us one moment. Oh, hold Tommy on. Tommy is dead in three times. He's in three times. So I'm going to remove two. Okay. The problem is you've got three dial-ins, so we're going to remove okay. them. Hold on. There we go. Tommy, try speaking now and see how you are. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you perfectly. Is that any better that's, for you? That's better for me. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, if I could just start by giving you a bit of context and background to where video relay services fit within the, the bigger picture of interpreting from our point of view. Uh, VRS is a very important part of interpreting. I mean, as, as members will know, sign language is a 3D language. It's... Um, involves hand movements, uh, spatial movements, um, facial movements, and is very much a face-to-face -face language. Um, VRS is a very important tool um, that helps promote um, deaf people's autonomy 
and gives them the opportunity to contact service providers directly in the same way that we're able to pick up a phone and ring through to a GP or whatever for information. Now, what we're looking at currently is the current interpreter pool. Um, members may be aware that there are limited numbers of uh, British Sign Language and particularly Irish Sign Language interpreters available here. Um, we're currently um, waiting on a report from our interpreters. We funded a, a survey of interpreters that will look at things like um, where they work with domains, for example, health um, benefits, do they work on VRS? What are their future intentions? And also, where they work, um, ge geographical site. This is all very important so that we can plan for the future and ensure, ensure that we improve access to interpreters. Um, as I say, we're waiting on that report. And once it's available, I'd be happy to share with the um, committee. Now, we've worked very closely over the past 14, 15 months um, with the Health and Social Care Board. Members will be aware that at the outset of COVID, there was um, it, it very much concentrated people's minds that there was insufficient um, accessibility to information for the sign language community. I suppose one of the big boons and one of the few positives from the um, COVID outbreak is the spotlight has been on sign language and the profile has been raised. Um, we were all, we've all seen Amanda and Christina at the daily briefings accompanying a minister to um, interpret into BSL and ISL. And indeed, um, Amanda and Christina are working with Queen's and they're going to provide us a report also into how that has been viewed within the deaf community. So as I referred, VRS is one tool in, in the communication toolbox for the deaf community. We, we are currently funding a, several projects to um, um, provide level six BSL and ISL courses for deaf and hearing students. To put that into context, level six is a necessity on the pathway towards a, a professional qualification as an interpreter or a translator. One of the issues we, we are looking at and will continue to look at is where VRS is used um, it's not so much of an issue now, whereby over the past year that we've largely been in lockdown and the number of face-to-face -face appointments has plunged and therefore the interpreters haven't been called out for face-to-face -face appointments. So if they're employed um, supplying VRS, it doesn't have an impact on their face-to-face -face availability. As we move out of restrictions, and those face-to-face -face appointments increase, there may well be a knock-on if more interpreters are employed on VRS services. So that is something we'll keep an eye on. That being the case, there's an argument there to increase our pool of interpreters, uh, to increase capacity, and the funding we're providing for level six will play a very key role in that. Now, what we're currently doing is basically collating information across the public sector on where VRS is currently employed and used. Um, in your the written briefing I provided, I gave you a rundown on obviously the health and social care, uh, um, remote interpreting service, a number of councils, the education authority and the housing executive all use VRS. What we'll do with that and we drill down deeper into the data that is available from there, we'll look at the uptick of that. Um, some of the contracts and availability of VRS across councils is low, as we're aware of. Also, we're looking at um, benefits within the department, um, the uptake of the service to access benefits. And I suppose what we're doing then, there's a ongoing monitoring group of the health and social care uh, service, and the numbers are being extremely encouraging. Up until March, um, some over 8,000 calls have been made um, by the deaf community. So there's been a real good uptake in that. And one of the reasons for that is, as part of that service, two deaf liaison officers have been employed and their role is to both promote the service and help the deaf community to access and log on to it, set up the apps or whatever. So that's very much a very proactive and hands-on engagement. And uh, I must pay tribute to colleagues in the Health and Social Care Board for the work that they've carried out with ourselves over the past year and setting up the service at pace in very difficult circumstances and monitoring it and looking at ways to improve it 
and that's the key. We're constantly evaluating the data and looking at ways that we can improve the service. And that is something, hopefully, that we'll be able to carry out with other um, um, providers of Averis across the public sector. We are seeking to reconvene the Sign Language Partnership Group nominations, hopefully by the end of this month. That is a forum which gives access to uh, the deaf community representatives and government departments. To, and the aim of that is to improve access to services. Now that hasn't met in a while, but it will play a very key role as we move forward and as we move forward towards and beyond legislation. Um, it is a, a vital forum where the deaf community can bring their issues directly to government departments. And I, I say repeatedly, we have the policy remit for um, BSL and ISL, but it is very much across the departmental issue. And we'll work with other departments. And the model we have with the Health and Social Care Board is a very good one, where when we work together, we can move at pace and improve the lives of the deaf community. I'm happy to take any questions uh, that the committee may have, Chair. Grant, Tommy, look, thank you for that. Um, you, you're, you will be aware that we did have a briefing from the deaf community um, a, a couple of months ago, and you'll also be aware, I'm sure, just how difficult that was for our, our committee clerks to, to set up here in Parliament buildings. Um, it, it posed many, many difficulties, um, and one of those difficulties actually was was um, being able to get an ISL interpreter. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that those qualifications are, are being progressed um, to enable people to get those qualifications to be part of this, because our deaf community are, are, are crying out for more support and more help, and they, they, have, they have been left behind. They've been left behind for a long time, because the VRS system that we have in place has been extremely piecemeal, um, to say the least. Um, in, in recent years, and it is, it's pretty poor of us that we, we haven't been uh, done as well as other parts. Um, though on a positive note, I, am, um, I think there is a positivity ahead. I think that the plans that you have set out are, are, are positive plans. Um, do, do I, one of my questions was around the sign language partnership and had they been involved in anything so far, but as you say, they haven't met in, in some time. And did you say they will be meeting up again before the end of this month, Tommy? We'll be seeking nominations for nominations. the group. Um, some we already have, and indeed, um, we've had an engagement with um, colleagues in the Department of Education over early years, um, provision of family signing, etc. Um, we'll be meeting with them in the near future also. How, do, how, do, how, does, how does that call for nominations go out, that it reaches all of those people? That um, you know that the, the the service users that you know certainly the ones that had came and briefed us um, as a committee. How does that how does that call for it, or call go out there for nominations? Well, the original model I think was about 2005. The Sign Language Partnership Group was set up um, shortly around about the time of formal recognition of BSL and ISL. Um, it involves departments nominating a representative to sit on the forum, and also we'd um, gone out to the deaf sector and they there are in place um, organizations who sit on the sign language partnership group now one of the first things that will need to be done is it will need to look at itself to see if that's still relevant um, what we would like to see the department would like to see would be not just organizations uh, on the partnership group but deaf service users individuals independent um, people who can speak for um, their experiences of, of their life experiences of trying to access services through sign language vrs being you know one example of that and as you said it has been patchy but over the past year i think the the take up of, of it has increased what we'll need to do then as we move forward is to look at who's provided it, where are the gaps and what is what is the cost implication to date and then look at how we can improve that um, well, for example, in a regional service, is that doable and, and a great funding model for that? But certainly, um, I think the group is a good forum and it's the right place to discuss cross-departmental sign language issues. But I think it could be more robust in taking um, independent deaf users on board as well. And, and pretty much the same model that the Health and Social Care Board 
um, took forward in our community cases strategy. Yeah, and I, I, work. I know that I mean we've with the, the buzzwords of co-design and all of that are, are something that we've been using for, for a few years now. Um, so I think that is essential that the, the users, uh, you know, their voice is given into this as well. And I know certainly I'd be proposing with our with our committee that we write um, after this back to our the, the the individuals that came and briefed our committee just to make them aware of these updates and and just what the the the, the trajectory is for this um, and about the nominations. Um, I just want to then, before I bring members in, just a, a, about the uh, work that's going to be undertaken then at Queen's, um, which will look at how, how uh, over the last year, um, and there have, there, there's been some really very good practice um, where we have had BSL and ISL interpreters um, behind our, our, our ministers whenever they've been doing those big announcements. I have brought it up in the chamber a couple of times, though, where we have been contacted, or I have been contacted by constituents as well, um, and it, it's not it's not a perfect service because certainly there are announcements made ad hoc, as we know, where it's not always possible, or there may be announcements are made that are, are not in a studio or not in parliament buildings or that are not somewhere where things can be organised pretty quickly. Um, and I think it's we need to always remember that, that you know, this is part of our community as well, that actually should be hearing uh, at the same time as the rest of us just exactly what is happening around COVID and our regulations. So it's just mindful, and that will be an interesting then to see that piece of work and that results of that. And I hope again that whenever Queen's are doing that, they do reach that out to as far and as wide um, a, a, a cohort of people as possible, and not just to the, the you know the main organisation or representative bodies. Um, so that, that again is something I look forward to seeing. Um, I'm happy enough to, I'm not going to open it up to members here. Um, Kelly, I know you had your hand up, it's gone down again, but I will just ask if you want to come in. Yep. Yes, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much, Tommy. I don't envy your work, but I do have a few questions on this. Um, for years, we had the text talk service where someone could key in a number in advance of a phone number, and then you could have somebody um, translate via text to a deaf person. Um, so deaf people are very well used to using that service. I'm just wondering on the video relay service, um, rather than a deaf person having to go and find out, and I know you've given us a list of, of all of the video relay services that are available. I'm quite keen that we follow, I think it's the Scottish model where you have one point of contact, doesn't matter how many suppliers are behind that point of contact, but there's one point of contact that you go through for a relay service so that it doesn't mean then that, that we, I know you said there that the usage at councils is low. Um, I phoned my own council and asked them how I got in contact with their video relay service and I'm still waiting for them to come back. They hadn't a clue. Um, and I have to say, if we took that out of the confusion of the system and had one, like the text talk, so I think it was 1-800 you dialed before a number and then you were automatically put through to an operator who was able to, to use the text service and to relay calls. If we were able to have something like that, um, it would be amazing. That's a huge ask and would need a huge investment, but it would mean then that we could have people, deaf people, not having to jump through hoops. Um, I believe personally that the department's missing a trick on this, that the Sign Language Act could have helped you in your work, and it would certainly have helped me in, in the work that I do within the Assembly if, if Sign Language Act was there. Um, I'm delighted to hear about the, the report and how the deaf community um, feel about the translations for um, the COVID announcements. That, that would be really interesting to read. But one of the things I wanted to ask is, you've talked about the low usage. Um, what are the councils doing about that? What are the organisations behind that doing about the low usage? Um, I haven't seen one single solitary um, promotion of VRS locally. Um, and, and to be honest, it's it's quite staggering because I am somebody who is deaf with a small d um, and I'm not aware of services that has even been provided by my local council. Um, so I'm just wondering, within your remit, is it within your remit to check to see when people are saying that there's low usage, what are they doing about it? Why is there low usage? How much money is being invested in communicating with the deaf community and others? There are lots of deaf people out there who don't consider themselves as part of the deaf community because they may not have been born deaf, but they may have, have had significant hearing loss as, as life has progressed and, and, and particularly into um, older age. 
um, a lot of people who stop using doctor's surgeries, for instance, at the moment with the telephone triage, because they can't hear, um, they just can't hear that service. So I'm just wondering, is there a move towards a regionalised access to VRS that may be manned by many different services um, behind the scenes, but is one Northern Ireland VRS system? And um, what if, if it is your responsibility, do you know is being done about the low usage? Okay, thank, thank you for that. I'll take your points in the order you made them. Regarding tax talk, not as you're, you're aware, um, isn't, all, isn't appropriate for a lot of deaf sign language users. Um, there's, there's so much research that um, deaf children are still leaving school with a very low reading age, and it's a conversation I had a couple of years ago with Universal Credit colleagues, and that their um, literature was based at a 12-year-old level. Whereas the research is consistently that deaf children leave school with the reading age of a nine-year-old. Um, council promotion, as part of our survey to um, councils, we wrote out to the quality officers within councils asking, do you use VRS? Uh, if so, which service, how much does it cost? And what is the uptick? Now, due to uh, commercial confidence, a lot of the information wasn't given, and it's understandable they signed a contract. But we know that the usage is low. Final question we ask, are you content that we promote the service through our database of contacts throughout the deaf community and the deaf sector? So that is what we'll do. In addition, during COVID, we were funding what was called the NI Deaf Daily News. I'm not sure if you came across it. It was a group of deaf BSL ISL users who took COVID news and translated it into PSL ISL due to the limited access on televised news. And that was a very important uh, service. As part of that, they were able to promote the health and social care service. So we're speaking to them at the moment. Their funding with us stopped, even though it was really geared at public health uh, information due to the emergency situation and the fact that we were um, working with the health board and co-funding their service up until the end of the last financial year. We, I'll be meeting with them again soon to look at uh, ways of continuing that service and that's a good medium for promoting what is available. As regards to a regionalised service, what we're trying to do here is to look ahead. What, what is currently being used? Is it working? We know that there's low uptake in councils. We know there's a good uptake in the health and social care. Um, how can we improve it? And does that move us towards a regional model? If so, how do we fund it? So for example, convergence will be an issue that you have several contracts and there, you know, there's different um, timelines, lifespans of that. So you would have to wait until those contracts run out. Now, colleagues in health and social care are keen to keep the remote interpreting service going. They have funding for this financial year to do that, to safeguard it. They want recurrent funding and they're seeking that to keep it going. Now, that is great news, but it also complicates bringing in a regional service, because if you have a big, and they're probably, health are probably going to be the biggest users of VRS, VRI. <clears throat> so if they're going away and with their own contract, that complicates the timing of it. But that is a conversation, an ongoing conversation we'll have with it. Uh, cognizant of the fact that with, in Contact Scotland, it started off as an NHS mm -hmm. service. The numbers were low, so then it, it widened and expanded to include other public sector services, voluntary and community services, and increasing numbers of private sector services. Now, we know as well that they've seen a large jump in the use of Contact Scotland during COVID and with increased costs also. So there's a few things we have to do. What's going on now? How do we improve it? How do we fund it? And that's a body of work we're taking forward. But also, as I referred to earlier, within the bigger picture of it interpreting. Because if, if more interpreters are going to move to online working, that pulls a rug and shows the floorboards at the other end. There's less interpreters for face-to-face. -face, and that's where we're trying to increase the pull. So it, it is, I mean, it's showing me it's just like the old generation game, plate spinning trying to keep them all going, but hopefully come out that's something that uh, is useful and workable for the deaf community. And I, I have met the deaf campaign group on several occasions, and we'll keep that engagement going as part of our consultation with the whole sector and community. Uh, Tommy, just to let you know, I've been working with Carla Lockhart, MP, um, Signature, developing a GCSE in sign language. Um, we're hoping that that 
being brought into schools. Number one, it will help to um, grow the amount of sign language users and people who can understand sign language across Northern Ireland. I think that it's a very practical type of course that would be very interesting for a lot of people and I think there'll be a lot of uptake for it. But it's also something that can provide training for professionals and adults apart from in-school um, learning for GCSEs. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward because as you say, most of the people who are involved with interpretation would be needed for a regional VRS type system and even to cover the, the health service. Um, my worry, of course, is on the ground that face to face, you know, whether it's, uh, for instance, from our point of view, tribunal appeals, you know, people being available to do that. We need more sign language interpreters for the deaf community. Um, my just my concern is that because we don't have that act coming behind the work that you're doing doesn't have to be taken on board by all departments and as much as we hope that departments recognize the needs of people who don't use English spoken English as their first language um, it's, it's not happening um, so it, it's a big job of work thank you for it I think that what you're doing and the progress that's happening is amazing so far um, I agree with you I think that the Scottish model where it started in health and expanded out then to include other um, areas of service provision um, may well be what we're looking at going forward um, but it, it's just the right time to try and push it forward never has it been so obvious to people about sign language those those sometimes daily COVID um, translations were, were so evident and so many people asking why are there two translators to highlight the fact that BSL and ISL is different um, but no thank you for your work if there's anything I can do I'm sure if the committee if the chair would agree with me we can do to help with that um, the more the better I know for instance within the assembly buildings um, committees can get access if, if there is availability to interpreters um, but unfortunately that's it um, outside of that all party groups members having meetings with the deaf community it's not available to us so quite often the deaf community are expected to pay to bring translators everywhere with them even to lobby us which is it's really disappointing but no i'm delighted to see the work that's going on um can't wait to read that report and thank you very much tommy please, please pass on my thanks to all you and all your team um for the work that you're doing because it's a tough one and the budgets are just not there for it um so keep up the good work please Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, no other member has raised their hand to come in. Um, I, I, I suppose, and I agree with Kelly, I'm really looking forward to this. And I think that as a committee going forward, um, uh, Tommy, we'll have you in again in the autumn time to give us an update. And what I would hope when we do that in the autumn time, that we will be able to organise again. And I know that the difficulties around this, but organise uh, BSL and ISL signers to actually, I mean, that... that I, I know with the way committees work and the way we get briefings, sometimes we have only two weeks' notice um, when we're getting a briefing. It would have been lovely for this briefing to have had um, us to have been able to have the signers on as well, just to, because I know um, that uh, the, the, the community have been watching. They've been watching our agenda. They've been asking us when he's going to be speaking about this again. We need to know. We want to know. Um, and sadly, they, 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 a lot of, for many, they'll not have been able to... to, to uh, understand and hear what has been said in, the, in this committee this morning. Um, so I think that is something that we need to look at. We, need, we as a committee need to do our part as well. Um, so whenever we get you back in, we'll plan it well in advance and we'll make sure that we have the BSL and ISL there. Um, then whenever you're giving us your you know some of the findings and some of the your plans for the way forward. Um, but I do think I, I, I do think it's positive, Soji, and I uh, certainly. Um, for as long as this committee is here, um, we will continue to champion this issue. Um, it's vitally important to all of us. Um, so, Tommy, thank you for taking the time to come in and speak to us today. Not at all, Chair. Always happy to speak about sign language. And if you need any help with sourcing interpreters, then just give me a shout for the next time. Oh, well, um, don't do, we'll hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> Our committee well, clerk will be very glad. Well, I know, I know. The difficulty was it's sourcing it, and we know, but we know all of those issues. But um, let's just ensure that we do we do that the next time round. So thank you, Tommy. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to just take a very short comfort break at this stage to prepare um, for our next witness session. Is our members happy enough with that? Okay. Okay, members, um, just before I move on to agenda item six, 
Um, I, I should have done it before we finished the last session on the VRS system. I know that um, with our committee having that responsibility for councils, it might be an idea that if we, um, as a committee, write to those councils directly. I know from my own um, local council in Antrim and Newton Abbey, um, they had brought a motion forward um, uh, not that long ago, because I remember Mark, got, Councillor Mark Cooper had brought it forward about the... the um, the deaf community within Antrim and Newton Abbey and what their council should be doing um, to, to assist with that. Um, so if we can just write out to the councils, I think, and just ask them um, around. The, we know we have those specific councils that are listed there that do have a VRS system in place, but then just to ask them as well, um, you know, how, how that is being managed and how that's being um, advertised. And then those other councils that aren't listed there, and just ask them, you know, given the responsibility here, what are they doing and when are they going to do it? Um, Kelly, you want to come in? Thanks, Chair. Um, Chair, I was going to actually say that my difficulty with this is, is the presumption of a low uptake. Yeah. Do those councils actually even know how many people within their areas are deaf or would need the service? Because you could have in an area, you could have 20 people who could use the service. In another area, you could have 100 people who could use the service. Um, my concern would be that the perception of low uptake, you might actually be covering the entire deaf community within your area, but you're perceiving it to be a low uptake because of, of numbers. But if you don't know how many deaf people you have, then how can you say if it's low or that's actually good coverage? Um, I agree with your writing out to all the councils. I'm staggered that there are a number of councils that don't have VRS. Um, so that means that somebody who's deaf, if they want to um, have, you know, have a query about their bin hasn't been collected, they're just ignored. There's no option for them. Um, I think that it's the right thing to do. Um, I think as the committee that's also responsible for sign language that would be coming through, hopefully at some stage um, through the minister, um, we need to be ensuring that our councils are fully inclusive. And if they're not already providing an appropriate service, why not? No, I think that's a good point. Um, and I don't know whether councils gathered that data under their community planning. They may well have. I don't know, and that's maybe a question that we need to ask. Um, every time I mention community planning, some of my councillors say, that doesn't include that in community planning. So I'm not going to be presumptuous there, so I'm not. Um, but um, I think that's just a question we need to ask of them. Fry, you had your hand up. Yeah, yes, sure, sure, just, uh, yes, I, I, I do think that uh, Kelly's uh, got a good point. I do, th I do believe that, uh, that there, there should be a database, or, and I know that there, there's a, a Centre for the Deaf in the Gravener Road, and I know that they do some uh, good work in it. It's actually quite surprising uh, when you, 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 uh, you interlink with people who are deaf, the, the amount of people that are not only fully deaf, but that uh, uh, have serious difficulties in hearing at all. And, uh, and after uh, a considerable period of time, that uh, there is no database of people that, uh, that can tap into, uh, that, 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 to say that they have problems and difficulties. I do, do believe that community planning, as you say, uh, 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 has a duty to ensure that everybody within the community uh, is plan for and that they're able to tap in and in, in, in this and the services i think maybe this is something that we need to keep our eye on uh not only with council uh, but with everything i had occasion to uh to, to, to speak at a number of um uh, events that was run by the deaf community and it's absolutely amazing uh when uh, when you sit down and you listen to them uh, 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 about what life is like in it. And, and it's not only the, the deaf community, because uh, equally, and we, I think yourself, myself, Paula, may have dealt with it as those that are blind yeah. and uh, are, are confined to their homes uh, because they fear of walking down the street or crossing the road or things. So uh, the, 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 there are people out there, including the deaf people, the uh, people who are blind, uh, that, uh, that, that need to be. Uh, confess that they have a share in this community. No, 100%, Fra. No, uh, uh, thanks for bringing up those points as well. I, I think we did, you know, whenever we were looking at the pavement cafes, I remember we had the, the, the oh, yeah. old DSA committee with the, with, the, with the blind community as well and the issues that that flagged up for them. Um, so, no, I think look, this is not something that I think the committee will, will, will put away for too long. I think it's something that we'll keep to the top of our list. 
Um, if we can do something about this before the, the something proactive about this before the end of the mandate, then I think it's worthwhile. And uh, I have to say, following on from that briefing that we did do with the deaf community, we had, you know, certainly I know uh, we had we had great praise for doing it because they were just so desperate that their no. voice be heard. Um, so, uh, so let's just continue with that positivity. Um, so if, if we can do that, if we can write to the councils first and foremost and ask just um, what they're doing and if they're not doing, why are they not doing it? Um, uh, and we'll start off there. So members, members happy of that? Sorry, I should have, I should have did that or done that before we went, uh, went offline there. But are happy enough with those proposals? Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. All right, members. We're going to then move on then to agenda item six, which is a raised briefing on the high street task force paper. Um, members, you'll find this agenda item starting at page 26 of your pack. Um, we have Michael Scholes with us, um, who is going to um, begin and give us a, a, a brief on this. Michael, you're very welcome. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? I can indeed. Go ahead. Great. Okay, well, with your permission, Chair, I'm going to uh, give a brief summary of the paper and I'll take some questions at the end, if that's okay. Uh, the paper's designed really to help uh, the committee with their scrutiny of the Northern Ireland Task Force. Um, now, I'm going to take you through each section and just briefly point out some key issues. The first section provides some economic context. It gives a summary of the Northern Ireland and the UK economies before and during COVID-19. And at this stage, I'd like to, to offer my thanks to my colleague, Chris Rothwell, who helped me with this section. Uh, I felt it was important uh, to set an economic context for the paper as the high street plays such a vital role in terms of employment and consumer spending. And as we can see from section one, uh, COVID-19 has had a large impact on our labour market. Section two then um, really gives an overview of the English High Street Task Force. Over the last decade, really, there's been a well-documented demise in high street bricks and mortar retailers, largely due to the rise of online shopping. And consequently, the UK government has introduced several policies to aim to boost the economic outlook of the high street. Now, I've listed these in table one of the paper, uh, which is on page 34 of your pack. The, um, sorry, let me just see. The, so I just lost my train of thought there. So the English Task Force really was set up um, in July 2019. Initially, there were 14 towns who were selected to receive funding. And each of the 14 towns are to receive 25 million in training and support. Now, this money comes from, over, comes from an overall pot of a billion pounds uh, funding from the Future High Streets Fund which again is mentioned um, at table one. The, uh, the funding now has to be spent, well, the majority of this, the funding has to be spent on capital projects. Now, not only that, uh, they have to meet certain criteria. They have to improve pro uh, transport access to town centres. They have to improve vehicle and pedestrian flow, relieve congestion, provide infrastructure for new housing and office spaces, and also turn vacant retail units into residential units. So that's the criteria that the, that the uh, High Street Task Force uses to uh, access that funding. Now, the Task Force also is an alliance really of 13 partner organisations, um, and these are presented in Table 2 um, of, of, the, of the paper on page 36 of your pack. Now, it's mainly run by the Institute of Place Management from the Manchester Metropolitan University. The Institute provides research for the task force and it develops the training and data dashboard products for its website. Now, there's two levels of support that is offered to local authorities. Firstly, there's direct um, support, which is needs-based. Uh, and again, these are listed in the table three of the paper, page 38 of your pack. Um, it also gives information resources um, such as webinars or data dashboards uh, that give football analysis. So moving on to section three there, um, section three looks 
at the rest of the UK and the Republic of Ireland. Now, in these jurisdictions, there isn't a single dedicated high street task force, um, but these areas have all seen significant interventions to help their high streets over the last few years. In Scotland, really, the key intervention is the Scotland's Town Partnership. Um, this is funded by the Scottish Government. Its role is really to act as a hub for, for information resources and to promote the profile of Scottish towns. Uh, it does this really through online resources, a little bit like um, the Institute of Place Management. Um, it has a library portal and this offers a series of webinars to, um, to assist applicants. In Wales now, the key intervention is the Transforming Towns Initiative. This offers over 100 million in funding from 2018 to 2021 and has recently actually received an extra 90 million pounds of funding. Now, that really is a mixture of direct support from the Welsh Government and loans from the Town Centre Loan Scheme. And more information on that uh, is at table seven of the paper on page 45 of your pack. Now in the Republic, the Retail consult Consultation Forum provides retailers with a link, a direct link really to local government. Now it published a framework for town centre renewal in 2017. And that really sets out the characteristics of what it should be viewed as a successful town centre. Um, and it also identifies existing support um, for retailers and local authorities. The framework also offers to help uh, the town and villages that are applying for funding um, from a €2 billion Euro urban regeneration and development fund. Also in the Republic, the Living City uh, Initiative gives tax incentives for refurbishing existing properties within special regeneration areas in six cities, that's Cork, Dublin, Galway, Kilkenny, Limerick, and Waterford. Um, so then, really, section four looks at some of the issues for the committee to consider in relation to the Northern Ireland Task Force. Now, I've put these key issues together under four main headings. Uh, and the first one is funding. So where is the money going to come from? It's a very obvious question. Governance then, um, who's going to run the task force and how are they actually going to run it? Expertise and knowledge, will universities have a, a key role? Uh, and what about libraries and I? Um, also, the programme for government, will the task force feature in the upcoming PFG? And I've also put various questions in blue boxes under each of those issues for the committee in the, in the paper. Now, Chair, as, as you will appreciate, uh, things have moved on, um, perhaps slowly since um, the paper was written in December, um, but that's uh, not a surprise given the COVID situation. But the task force met then for the first time in February of this year, uh, and it was chaired by junior ministers. A statement from the executive office was then released on the 24th of February, noting that the task force was to work under the, under the auspices of the Executive COVID-19 Task Force. Um, so also four subgroups have been established, um, one for influencing policy and strategy, one for promoting uh, the development of capacity, uh, developing and promoting good practice is another one, and influencing and shaping intervention and investment is the last one. Now, the statement also said that the Secretariat to the Task Force will be provided by the Department for the Communities, led by a senior official from the Department, according to ministers through the Executive Office. So that is a, a brief summary of the, the paper, Chair, and I'm happy to take any questions that uh, members may have. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And yeah, I know that um the things have moved on a little bit from this, from from whenever we asked for the paper back at the end of last year, and I think it, it was on the back of maybe a briefing by the, the Belfast Chamber, or uh, that this was highlighted about the task force. Um, it, just then, we know then, as you had said, they held their first meeting on the twenty fourth of February. Um, do we know um, any more than that? And, and, and I know it wasn't part of your research, but do we know any more that on that of the, how often it has met since then? 
I'm not really aware that it has been since then, Chair. I think that the initial meeting was really to set up the um, the terms of reference and to, to basically, I guess, facilitate a statement that was uh, that I, I um, alluded to earlier on in, in, in my oral briefing there. But I'm not aware of, of any subsequent um, meetings. Uh, but obviously, the, the co committee may wish to to write to the department to find that out. Yeah, and I, I do like we've got lots of your blue boxes here with lots of questions in them. So, uh, yeah, I think there'll be plenty of questions we'll be able to field um, through. Certainly, um, as the secretariat, didn't you, the secretariat of the overall task force is coming from the Department of Communities. Isn't that correct? Is that what you said? That's yeah. that's what it says, yes. Which again uh, raises um, a few questions in itself. Um, in terms of resourcing the task force, I mean, is that going to be extra staff that's needed? Um, you know, is there going to be extra costs or perhaps um, some uh, extra IT work that's going to be uh, involved in that? And, you know, what what size is, is that secretary going to be and at what level? They've said a senior official, but um, these are all questions, obviously, that the committee can put um, to officials um, in the future. But I think that that statement was quite interesting. Um, and um, it partly answered some of the questions that I put in the initial paper. No, thank you for that. And we know that you know these the high street task force were in place before COVID in in other jurisdictions. Um, were working pretty well. And um, were, were was was there any of those jurisdictions where it stood out as being something uh, that where regeneration was actively happening? And I'm talking pre pre COVID. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the main the main thing in the UK um, and the Republic is is that the well, certainly in the in the UK and uh, GB, the the interventions really are all ca mainly capital projects, which take a long time um, to work through and a long time to build up and to set up and require a considerable amount of resources. So any evaluation is really too early to say. Um, about any evaluation of those particular capital projects. Um, but I've, I have listed um, quite a few in some of the tables um, uh, of note. I, I think the I think the thing the thing that um, that strikes me um, in terms of the GB um, task force, um, sorry, the, the English task force is that how much how much work has been done in terms of providing information resources to local councils um, and how much work has been done by the Institute of Place Management in the, um, in the University and Metropolitan University of, of Manchester. So there's been a lot of work done preparing the way and, and assisting um, local authorities, but I think it's too early to say to any value, any, any, um, any, um, capital projects of, that have happened per se. What, what I will say though is that the, as you quite rightly said there Chair, this paper was really just to give an overarching um, kind of view of the high street task force type initiatives that were happening in the UK and the Republic. So it's at a very high level um, the, and I didn't really go into a huge amount of detail on the particular individual interventions but that's something we could look at um, going forward. No, Michael, it, it, it's a great paper and it is it's, it is very detailed, um, but it does lay out very much the, the, the plans um, that other jurisdictions um, have had in place. And, you know, we really don't need to reinvent the wheel with a lot of this. Um, a lot of it is there. Um, so, no, I thank you. That It's an excellent piece of work. Um, I'm going to open up to members. If only one member who has um, indicated they want to speak, and that's Kelly. So if we can bring Kelly in, please. And questions. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, huge piece of work. Very, very interesting, and I'm, I really appreciate it. Um, sorry, just quick there. Um, I was just wondering, um, with when you looked at the English wheel, I was particularly interested in Wales, where they talked about coastal communities and and that type of thing. I'm just wondering, in those areas, have the councils got regeneration powers? You know, I hear we retain regeneration powers. Um, within the you know the assemblies or the department's remit um across in gb is that where the councils now i know here our councils are akin to parish councils and, and we're more like a local council but 
um, is it a case that those councils there in GB have regeneration powers? Um, I, I didn't really cover that particular issue, but I am aware that councils uh, and authorities have wider ranging powers in GB than we have here, as you quite rightly say. Um, but yes, it, it would be my understanding that that, that would be the case. Um, Wales is a particularly interesting one where the, the, the money, if you like, for regeneration actually has been given to various regions. It's just been given. Um, and then really it's up to them what they do. But um, whereas the English um, system tends to rely on bids um, for particular monies and have to fill out various applications that involve possibly um, complicated criteria in terms of capital projects. But, but I think if the overall point, and the, the coastal generation one is a very, very good um, one to pick up on, but the overall point that, that I hope to get across in this paper is that, that all of these interventions are really only as successful as the, the amount of community buy-in that, that, um, that they afford. Communities are crucial to this, and that's really why I mentioned um, the NI libraries, um, their involvement. I mean, the the task force, the Northern Ireland task force hasn't really mentioned the NI libraries because I think universities um, are on the task force, task force, and they will probably play this role of sorry, information retrieval. But I, I was thinking that, as we know across, sorry, I'm straying off your point slightly, Chair, but um, the, as we know, all our libraries are right in the heart of our communities and they're perfectly placed to disseminate information. Um, and so, and again, to just re-emphasize re, um, this, this point of, of community buy-in, I thought that the, um, the libraries could act as a great hub for, for information for, for the locality. Um, but yes, on that planning, I can certainly come back to you on the planning partners. Um, per, yes, uh, um, in Wales and Scotland, but it would be my understanding that Wales would have considerable powers um, in, in, in terms of planning. I just thought that, as you say, the community buy-in, you know, if, if like Wales, you know, where there's a set amount of money passed over and it's up to the local area to design and devise what's appropriate for that area, it just seems to be more, well, I think it's more successful. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was the definition that we have in Northern Ireland of urban and rural is causing problems because um, we already know that the minister has had to withdraw funding for some um, areas for regeneration that have been applying uh, because rural has always been any settlement up to two and a half thousand and urban has been over five thousand, but we have rural areas that have towns that fall between that and that's outside of DERA and it's outside of communities and to be honest it's driving me nuts at the minute um, there doesn't seem to be anything coming through that high street task force that well I suppose they haven't met very often that's going to deal with that um, because we're basically denying what are quite a lot of coastal areas which are my interest um, any available any access to regeneration money then yeah I mean that's an excellent point the I think the point was made also about regional balance of the task force itself earlier by, um, uh, it could have been possibly in the separate committee, but um, uh, you know, where's the regional balance in the, a lot of the, the membership of the task force seems to be um, Belfast centric really, where's the regional balance in terms of other, um, other uh, areas. Um, so that, that is going to be an issue. And I think also that the fact that you know, we don't know, and nothing's been said about the, the application process, or and we're still at the extremely um, early stages. We don't know if it's going to follow the wheels, um, you know, where the money is just going to be given into areas, or there be a bidding process, or will there be loans involved, um, all sorts of, uh, of things that, like this will be coming into play. Um, but... I think the regional balance and the community buy-in is a very, very important issue. As you quite rightly say, there, Northern Ireland doesn't like um, really any other place in in in, in the in the UK. It has. You know, we do have. I mean, even in Belfast, you just look up and you can see the mountains and the and the you know uh, the countryside. So we have a very different geographical um, 
base here. So that is a very good point. And we, we need to look in the committee, especially, we'll need to be very wary of that going forward. How, what criteria is used for the areas? Is it urban, rural? I mean, villages and town centres have been the phrase that's been used time yeah. and time again. But I don't know if that, if that really cuts it, if we're going to make really long lasting change to communities um, that, that, that live in our, in our perhaps more rural areas. No, that's brilliant, Michael. Thank you very much. And I love all the questions that you've provided for us. Do you love them when they come in front of the committee? Because it's all spelled out there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. I just, just one more thing, just to, to ask, um, Michael, did your research shed any, any light on why we were so late in, in this high, high, for, or high Street Task Force coming forward? Um. Uh, no, I didn't really see anything like, like that that, um, that that would indicate. I mean, I, the obvious things are COVID and, um, you know, the, the executive obviously was busy with, with COVID and what has happened. I mean, I pointed out that the, the, there, is, there was a high street task force, if you like, earlier on in, um, in Northern Ireland and in the, in, the, in the Assembly and, sorry, in the, uh, the executive. The, um, again, though, it was very much driven by um, civil service uh, and by the department officials. Um, so I put a little bit of that into the paper as well, just to have just the members to have a look at that, because um, I, I um, perhaps is a concern that those mistakes may be repeated, and that the, um, the again the, the role of the of the the. Um, of the department for the communities is, is seen as it's been mentioned as, as a secretariat role which would lead us obviously to think it's an administrative role um, but we just don't know um, we, we need more um, more clarity really on, on all of the issues but but the, the, I didn't see anything per se that um, that was a particularly um, a barrier um, to, to, um, to bring in this slightly forward. Well, look, that's fine. I have Mark Durkin, sorry, has his hand up. If we can bring Mark in. There you go, Mark, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for that presentation. Michael does a, a very detailed and very interesting paper. I, I particularly like the way that you have looked at, at other jurisdictions and seen what they're doing uh, in comparison to us, which <laughs> is, is very little to date, sadly. Uh, see in Wales the town centre loans scheme. I'm kind of interested to hear maybe a wee bit more about how that works. You know, who, wh wh where does the money come from? See, like the fifteen years to pay back, or do, yeah, how long has well, that been running, and, 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 and have there been any issues that have arisen uh, to date? I don't think it's been running that long. I'll just try and get that, get it up on the. Uh... The screen beside me here with the paper on. Um, I should have pointed out it was December that I wrote this paper in, so it's uh, quite a while since I've looked at it. Um, yeah, the, the the funny that's that's an interesting point because loans. Uh, I, I've also been been working for. Um, I've just finished a paper that looks at six uh, European and, and um, United States. Um, High Street Task Force or High Street Renewal um, areas, and, and one of them in um, let me see, I think it's in, in Detroit offers forgivable loans, um, and basically what they do is they they offer the loan to to the um, to the local authority and have and basically give them the first two years free, so they don't have to pay it back for two years. Then they offer very um, interesting terms. Um, and then they effectively get the last two years free as well. But but in Wales, um, they they basically have the, the they have extra flexibility. The local authorities in Wales to, to borrow money more than we would have. Our local authorities, as far as I'm aware, um, do have the authority to borrow now under an overall borrowing limit, which is set by the executive. But uh, my colleagues in the financial scrutiny could tell you more on that. Um, but the Welsh um, example is interesting because they, they are allowed flexibility to take the initial loan and then also use it for other projects that come up. So, so there is a lot of flexibility around that, that process. Um, and 
Um, that's some, it's quite an innovative way. And another thing that actually I didn't use in the paper, and I just was thinking about it, um, is the use of financial transaction capital. Yeah. Um, that that would could work perfectly well because it's capital money. Um, it's a, it's a flexible. It's innovative. It's um, you know it, a lot, and it's been relatively underused as far as I'm aware. Again, my colleagues in the financial scrutiny unit could tell you better, but. Um, that would be a, a, a definitely a resource um, that would be looked at and I, I, I regret that I forgot to actually mention that in the paper because that would be a question for well I guess for the Department for Finance um, but TOE certainly could um, ask that question as well as the communities no, I, um, I was going to go there <laughs> I was going to go there so you... alright okay yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, I can't believe I forgot to mention it in the paper you know it's the local authority that takes the loan, but the, yeah. how do the private sector feed into that, or or, or avail of it? Can, can they take loans in from the local authority? Yes, yes. As far as so again, as far as I'm aware, and my, my colleagues will um, be better uh, judged, uh, better better place to answer this. That the loan is then loaned on um, at again increasingly less um, a favourable, sorry, more favourable interest rates. Uh, and then paid back in, in instalments to um, to central government. Um, but again, we can do more uh, more work on that as we get into the nitty gritty of, of when we see more fr from um, the high street task force. We can we can look at that. Um, I mean, I've looked uh, very recently, as I said, about you know, six um, six particular um, high street renewal projects in Detroit, Toronto, Berlin, and three others. Um, and I've gone into more detail on those. Um, uh, actually, looking at the the, um, the the projects themselves, and this idea of the forgivable loans has cropped up uh, in Detroit. So that's another piece of work, perhaps, that um, I'm willing to undertake. No, no, I'm sure that there's plenty of work for you to to, to undertake. Uh, Mike, I'm just concerned about the, the length of time that it's taken us to get where we are. And by your own admission, we're, we're still in the very early stages, and I, I think that's the, the scary part, uh, given, I suppose, that we're already lagging behind other jurisdictions in this regard. Our high streets were in a perilous enough place prior to, to, to COVID, and, and they're, I suppose, in an even more fragile uh, state now. And I'm not blaming you in any way for that, Michael. D don't worry, but it, it's extremely concerning when even the department isn't entirely sure of, of, of its own role in this. Uh, now, uh, since the meeting in February, the, I was going to say the first meeting, but and, and the last meeting of the High Street Task Force in, in February, what, how much activity has there been and, and what sort of activity? Because I accept it, it is... Of the civil service or civil servants really driving it, but because there been much activity outside of the, that formal setting, if you like. Well, I'm not really aware of of an yeah, outside of formal setting. The the all that I had to go on was the, the statement. I think that would be a question for the officials. Um, or oh, well, be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, in, in fairness, in, in uh, you know, capital projects and this type of renewal does take time, um, and you know, capital projects are typically 10, 15, 20 years. Um, but I, I think some of the things that could, could certainly be happening sooner, um, the, the idea of like talking to the communities, um, you know, actually setting up. The, uh, if you like the infrastructure of, of, of how this is going to happen um, could certainly perhaps um, have been moved on a little bit quicker but that's you know I mean I'm not criticising the department there it's just um, from the outside obviously they have a higher priority perhaps with COVID Okay no super Michael thank you Okay, Mark, thanks for that. No other member has indicated they want to ask anything further, Michael. So thank you. Thank you for a really detailed paper. Thank you for your list of many, many questions. And I think then after today, there have been a few more added on to that list of questions for the department. Um, um, and, um, you know, we, we may require just further information. And I, I do know, like, 
Um, we, we, a lot of the some of the stuff that we've asked you today is not within your remit um, to, to know the detail around that. So I appreciate that. Um, but thanks again. Um, we really do appreciate the work that Raise does, and, and this um, briefing paper in particular will be very useful um, going forward. Thank you, thanks, Michael. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Come on. Okay, members, um, we'll bring all members in again, Oliver, if you want, because we're getting near the correspondence parts. But uh, just following on from that, then, members, uh, there are many, many questions that, that Michael himself has put uh, set out there, and also more questions that have arisen from this meeting today. I don't know if we have any plans uh, as yet in our diary for a briefing from the department as they are the secretariat for this, um, not before not before recess anyway. No, and I realise we only have um, a limited number of weeks left, so that might not happen before that, but we could certainly ask for a written briefing, so we could in the interim, um, that they provide us with an interim, an interim briefing um, on their roles and responsibilities around this and how they, they plan to take that forward. Would that be acceptable, members? Yeah? Sure, absolutely. Um, could we write to, and maybe, I'm wondering, should we provide the paper to um, the department and ask them to answer the questions in their written briefing when they come back to us? But it might also be worthwhile to ask similar questions um, of the executive office where that senior officer is located and for them to provide a written briefing on when the meetings are due to happen, the expansion of um, the, the high street grouping across Northern Ireland to ensure that, as Michael has said, and we have indicated before, that there's regional balance on it. Um, and for clar we need clarification on that urban-rural, because it's been pussy-footed about at the minute. It's not good enough. Um, there, there's quite a lot there, um, but I, I'm very aware of our limited time, and a written briefing might, might give us a lot of the answers. Yeah, what I was going to suggest as well, I don't know if any member on our committee also sits on TEO. Um, do we need to write the TEO committee to ask them um, what if they have had any briefing sessions or evidence sessions on this as well? Um, because I know we're quite conscious that we need to give them their place as well. If, if they have had any briefings, we you know could they share that information with us also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Fair enough, Andy, go ahead. Just given the cross-cutting nature as well, sure, it might be worth sharing the, the briefing paper with the various different committees across um, the departments as well. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think that um, this will, it is cross-cutting, absolutely, um, and will affect many committees. So I, I don't, I think it actually is a, it's a, it's a, it's a good paper, um, most definitely, to share across the board. Are members in agreement with that? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I think. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Fra. The, uh, as I said, it was, a, it was a, obviously a very interesting briefing and, and very, uh, uh, has a very, uh, quite, as I said, quite a number of questions. But I think uh, we're moving into a new territory. I think that uh, on the workings of our way out of COVID, uh, that uh, there's obviously speculation, the huge impact that that will have on the high street and the shape. Uh, that the high street will take anything, and I think that needs to be taken into consideration too. I think that uh, when you look at there are quite a number of groups, including bids, uh, that 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 has been out and about there uh, for a while and has worked uh, not not to a very high degree, but it did allow people if they wanted to uh, to to to, uh, to 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 put resources into uh, their own part of the community. So I I, I, I do think. That uh, yes, get the, the the department in, asking what the crack is. But uh, we also need to take into consideration that besides what's happening with the task force, there are many councils that are involved in uh, in regeneration and uh, and some of it multi million uh, new agendas. And I, and we need to try to work where that works in uh, to to the task force was they have set. Uh, they, they, they have set themselves targets over the next 20 years uh, that would hopefully, hopefully uh, change the face of our city centres. Yeah, you're, absolutely, and I do get the, the, the business, business improvement districts and um, that urban regeneration, um, and regeneration, sorry, not just urban regeneration, regeneration in, in, in totality. Um, all fits into this. It, it, it all joins together. I can see, you know, part of this is the Department of the Economy. 
you know, there's there's lots of, of facet facets that will pull this together. Um, so I don't know. I mean, members, I, I think our first place to start off is the secretariat. Um, yeah. Definitely. Uh, for the which is the Department of Communities, I think all of our committees um, should see sight of this as well for their information, um, and then we we take it from there when we get some responses back. And I want, and I think at this stage we're asking for a written briefing. We're not asking for um, them to come in because I think it'll be too tight before recess. We'll get them in in the autumn time, all being well, um, to, to discuss further. But hopefully they'll be able to answer some of those questions that Michael has set out in his paper um, and uh, I mean some of them may well be very easy to answer because um, when Michael did this paper it was back in December 2020 let's not forget or sorry 20, yeah 2020 I don't even know what year it is right now um, so yeah so some of them they might be able to answer pretty quickly others might take a bit more um, uh, scoping and they may have to go beyond their, their, their uh, beyond the assembly and go to our local councils and, and beyond um, so are members happy that, that we move in that direction with this? Yeah? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, folks, are we happy to move on? Yeah. <coughs> okay, thank you. Then I'm going to take you to agenda item seven, which is correspondence. Um, you'll find the correspondence memo at page 59 of your packs. Can I draw your attention to page 60, which is a letter from the Finance Committee regarding the Fiscal Council for Northern Ireland. Members, this was including in last week's paper when it was decided that it should be brought back for further discussion today. Um, members, we have been asked to comment on a number of areas which are listed in the letter, which is functionality, discretion, powers, independence, competence, credibility and assembly engagement. So it's just to open that up to ask if members any comments they want um, to feed back um, for the, in order for the committee um, to, to send some sort of response back? Or can they do that via email or can they get that to the committee clerks? <coughs> yeah? Sorry, say again, Kelly. Sorry, I did miss that. Well, I've raised my hand there. Um, if I could come in. Yes, certainly. Go ahead. Just to thank everyone for a uh, note last week, I'd asked if we could move this um, letter to this week. I'm largely content with what the Committee for Finance has um, put forward here. Um, there is an opportunity here, for instance, I'm very concerned, and just as an example, and um, this is only one example um, relating to ourselves here, we've had, the budget has been confirmed with welfare mitigations budget um, confirmed within that to close the loopholes. But we're not seeing any legislation that allows that to happen. So something like the Fiscal Council can be asking questions. You know, there's no point in the Department of Finance putting into a budget um, spend areas that, that then other departments are not taking the legislation forward to enable that to happen. And that has a direct impact on people in the community. One of the other things that the Fiscal Council, I believe, could help us with is this cross-cutting expenditure issue where we do have the programme for government, which is, is hitting across all different um, committees um, and, and the scrutiny that we're looking at. But we're looking at our committee. We're not looking at the outcome, which may be across two or three different committees. So I don't know whether there's something there. I think that there should be something there for the Fiscal Council to review how effective um, that cross-cutting expenditure or scrutiny of cross-cutting expenditure has actually taken place to achieve outcomes. It doesn't ask it to, to say what we should be doing. It's just how effective is that. So I think that, I don't know, as a, as a committee, I'd be quite happy for us to go back and say, yes, we support the Fiscal Council. It came in um, under New Decade, New Approach, of course. Um, and there's there are issues from our point of view as a committee that we would be looking for the Fiscal Council to consider um, because there are some concerns there. Okay, no, and they're good points that you've made. Kelly, anybody else want to make comment on that? Are we happy enough then to go forward with that? Yeah? Okay, all right, okay, fair enough. Um, we'll move on then to, um, can I draw your attention to page 63? which is a letter from BT in relation to the launch of Hope United, which is a diverse team of players who have to come together across the home nations to tackle online hate. The letter is calling for the committee's support via its social media channel. Are members content to support this initiative? 
Yes. Yep, I think it's, it's good yeah. that we do. Okay, thank you for that. I have nothing further I need to bring up under correspondence. Do any other members have anything they want to bring up at this stage under correspondence? No? Okay. Then can I then um, ask then, are we content then with the, the actions of uh, within the correspondence memo um, uh, and, and to, to include what we've discussed today? Yeah? yeah. Okay, all right. I'm going to then move on to agenda item 8, which is our forward work programme. Members, at next week's meeting, we will be briefed by NICFA and CO3 on post-COVID recovery. Then we'll get a briefing from the department on the June monitoring round, and we will also have a briefing on the draft charities bill. Um, so are members content with that? Agreed. Okay. Then I'll move to agenda item 9, which is any other business. Members, any other business they want to bring up? Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Well, it, it's kind of it's, it's not unrelated the, the issue that Kelly highlighted there when she was talking about the, the fiscal council, and it's a situation where we are in now where uh, the budget has given the green light for, for money to close the welfare mitigations, which is great. It's something we've all been been, been shouting about and, and pushing for, but in the absence of the legislation coming through, that that's no good. Uh, I know last week we agreed to seek a briefing from officials on where the legislation is at. And I don't know when we're going to get the briefing, but <laughs> I'd much rather get the legislation, uh, to be honest. What are the implications of that legislation not being passed in advance of the summer recess? Are we going to see a big underspend and, and money that's there to protect and assist vulnerable people? actually having to go back on spend. So, uh, I... Yeah, no, that's fair enough, Mark. I, I know that that letter was sent. Um, we haven't received anything back. Maybe I asked then the clerk when she's speaking with the Dallow um, after the meeting to say that this is, this is a priority, that we certainly want this <coughs> most definitely before the end of, of, of this period, before we go into recess of Andy and then of Fra. Andy, go ahead. Just, just for the Mark's point, and, and I'm grateful that we will be seeking a briefing in, in the interim. Can we perhaps write to the Minister to seek clarity as to where it currently sits? Has the, the paper been approved by the Executive in relation to the welfare supplement mitigations? Um, obviously, there's various different aspects um, gambling, charity bills, etc., that's coming forward that ultimately must have gone through the Executive. Um, so, so, where does the current um, welfare supplementary mitigations sit? Okay, we can ask that question as well. Absolutely, Fra. Well, Chair Andy has raised the point that I was going to raise that uh, I think uh, we, we have raised this with the department I think, on, on several occasions. I know that Mark has raised it in the past. Uh, I had said the last time that what, what I think we need to do is to get the information from the executive uh, because I know that you, you, you have a minister who is in who is totally committed uh, to, to, to seeing this through. So there has, I think what we need to do is to try that. Uh, find out where, where, the, where uh, or if there is any blockage uh, the legislation comes through. No, I agree with you. And if there is, we need to find out why there's a blockage. No, um, that, that would be good to know. Um, Kelly? Um, Chair, just to follow on, I agree with what everybody has said so far. I'm at the end of my tether, to be quite frank, with the department on this one. I don't care where the blockage is at. I would like the department to confirm for this committee how many people are now in those loopholes how much it's cost to those people on a weekly basis, what's coming out of their pockets because this legislation has not been taken forward. And I don't care if that embarrasses all of the executive ministers. We have people who have fallen through a loophole that we agreed, we all agreed politically in New Decade, New Approach, that we would have Northern Ireland mitigations to take people out of poverty and to support them because of the terrible situation Universal Credit leaves people in. I think it's time that the DALO does go back to the, the department and just says, right, the committee's just about had it with us. Um, they need to know how many people are impacted. They need to know the cost that this is causing people. I want to know specifically, is this going to be um, retrospective payments? Because um, we already know that there's over 10,000 people in rent arrears for the housing executive. Um, this is legislation that is harming people on a daily basis. I've had it. The Cliff Edge Coalition have spelt this out to this committee time and time again. The advice sector have told us time and time again. I know that the minister is committed to this, but until the legislation comes, it's just talking shop. We need movement. 
No, I understand that, Kelly, and I, I think um, I know certainly as a, as a committee, um, it's something that we have brought up time and time again. So we we just need to get to the bottom of it and find out what what the hold up is and get those questions answered. So no, we'll we'll certainly do that as well. Can I just then also, under any other business, just inform members that our communications here in the assembly are drafting a press release um, to coincide with the consideration stage of the licensing bill. I did a, a video um, clip on that a few weeks ago. Um, so it's just that just to let you know that whatever we're putting out, um, it will be circulated to members on Monday um, for their agreement before that does go out. Are members happy enough with that? Yeah? yeah. All right. Yeah. Is there any other business members want to bring up? Or can we move on? Okay, then I'll move on to agenda item 10, which is date, time and location of next meeting. Can I advise members that our next meeting will take place here in room 29 next Thursday, the 10th of June? And we're, we are going slightly earlier than 10. We're going to 9.30 next week because we have four briefings next week. Um, uh, uh, Sean was pressurising me into 9.15, but we've settled on 9.30. I think we can get through the, the four briefings in that time. So members content with that? Yeah? Okay. Yes. Okay, members, thank you very much. I look forward to Tuesday, to the licensing bill in the chamber. Um, and also we've got the, the, the pensions, uh, or sorry, the budget as well on Tuesday, rather. Um, so I will speak to you all next week. Thank you very much for your time. Don't forget to send us those idiots, guys. Yeah, <laughs> not a problem. Thank you. I see some real idiots, one No bother. Look, thanks, everybody, for your time today. Thank you. Bye. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.